fasting. It's a big topic in Scripture, but it's not really a big topic in the life of the church, is it? I can think of, well, my entire experience living and breathing church, and in worship, the topics never come up. In all my time of discipleship, in all my time of growing and studying, the topic never, ever came up. Fasting. Could you put the first slide up? It's moving from theoretical Christianity to applied and practical discipleship. Moving from theoretical Christianity to applied and practical discipleship. Sometimes we have a, a relationship with God that exists in theory, and other times we have a relationship with God that's practical. We live it out. And this morning, as we take a look at fasting, you'll have to decide whether fasting fits into the theoretical or the applied. Now, we've been doing the Red Letter Life, studying the Sermon on the Mount since January, and we've told you this over and over again. We are walking through Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, listening to, paying attention to all the cues for how to live the life that Christ wants us to live. And in this pinnacle sermon of his, he's given us some hard things, some really hard things to deal with. Um, and over and over in the section that we've been looking at lately, you hear Jesus talking about hypocrisy, how not to be a hypocrite, and how to have an authentic and applied faith. He's made it clear that our motives matter. Now, speaking of motives, I have to do a couple things right now. Number one, my wife is down at the Brody campus, so I've always wanted to do this. Hi, Amy. It's good to see you. <laughs> You look really good today. <laughs> and also, today is my son's, not today, but this week while I was in Guatemala, uh, my son celebrated his 18th birthday. So, hi Noah, congratulations. <laughs> so, we've been talking about the Red Letter Life for a while, and uh, it's been really, really rewarding and really challenging, because Jesus is putting difficult things on our plate, things that maybe we assumed that we knew, but in reality, when he talks about them, we didn't know much about it at all. When we talked about giving and charity, we talked about that it should be done quickly and quietly, without any hurrahs, out any fanfares, um, and it has to be in response to God. It can't be about how it's going to make you feel to give. It can't be about how it's going to make someone else feel to give. It has to be in a response to God because it moves us closer to God when we give in the right way. Britta, when she talked about prayer, made it clear that our prayer life has to be private. There's a part of our prayer life that needs to be just simple, quiet, pulled away, where you can go and you can kneel and bring your life before God. And it can't be about how other people see us pray or hear us pray. It can't be about how we feel about our prayer life. It has to be a response to God. And in a good prayer life, it moves us closer to God. And today, as we're going to take a look at Jesus talking about fasting, well, I want you to consider maybe stopping doing something is the best way to get filled by God. Stopping doing something may be the best way to get filled by God, because I believe, honestly, that fasting moves us closer to God. Slide, please. So I broke it down real simply for those three little things that he was talking about in, um, in the sermon, which we're going to read in a second. It's for, for giving, it's just give and go. Just give and go. Say it with me. Give and go. The second one is kneel and listen. Say it with me. Kneel and listen as for prayer. And the third one is stop and be filled for fasting. Say it with me. Stop and be filled. It's awesome. You guys are so good at this. Next slide. We're going to take a look at the scripture right now. When you fast... Do not look som somber as the hypocrites do, for they, they disfigure their faces to show others that they are fasting. Truly I tell you that they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be, so it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is, who is unseen, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks. Thanks be to God. I find this interesting because all of the other things that Jesus tells us to do, don't be a hypocrite, you know, don't put on a show, it, it makes sense. Don't put on a show when you pray. Don't put on a show when you give. Don't act like it's a big thing. But when you're fasting, you are physically uncomfortable. Your stomach grumbles. This is one of those times where Jesus is saying, just cover it up. This is 
Put on the show. Don't, don't make a big production of it, but just do it. See, Jesus is talking in this section about humility. And when it comes to fasting, you can't be humble by saying, hey, I'm the most humble person in the whole wide world. You can't do it. If I've told you once, I've told you a thousand times, never exaggerate, right? It, you, you, you can't be humble by pointing to yourself and saying, look how humble I am. Because fasting is ultimately an act of humility. See, it is, easier, it is either, either for yourself, you're doing it for yourself, you're doing it for a show so people can see it, or you're doing it for God. Each one of those has its own payment. Who are you working for? Are you working for yourself so you can give yourself a pat on the back? Are you working for the applause of others so they can lift you up and give you a pat on the back? Or are you working for God? His payment plan and his benefits are eternal. Take your pick. Who do you want to work for? And again, I don't think fasting is something we hear nearly enough about in our discipleship. Um, I, th I think people talk about fasting when it comes to their diet. People talk about fasting when it comes to their health regime. Sometimes they'll talk about it can make you faster, stronger, bigger, this, that, more hair, all these things. But maybe even have less stinky breath. But when it comes to Scripture, Jesus is really clear. Richard Foster, in his book, Celebrate Discipline, he writes, fasting seems out of place and out of step with our times. And I really agree. It's just something that in our culture, we as disciples of Jesus really don't take that seriously. But did you know, in the New Testament, there are more references to to fasting than there are to repentance and confession. Scripture treats fasting, or at least talks about fasting, more than it talks about repentance and confession. So is fasting something Christians really should be doing? I believe there's plenty to support that, there's, that fasting is something that we all should consider doing. See, Jesus fasted for 40 days in the wilderness. We all know that story. And when it was all done, he was hungry. Uh, the church fasted as they served the Lord. If you read the book of Acts, you'll see over and over again how the church stopped and fast. The church stopped and fast when they were sending out missionaries. The church stopped and fasted when they were selecting elders. Daniel in the Old Testament stopped and fast when he was in prison. He had a partial fast. He only ate fruits and vegetables. But he fasted to focus. They fasted to focus or to refocus their hearts. Over and over again, I see this theme of taking the time to stop and focus or refocus our hearts in, in the Scriptures. Um, in fasting, you're petitioning God for something that's of ultimate or significant importance to you. You think it's so important that you're going to focus your life on this one thing for a certain amount of time. So unless you have a medical reason, uh, unless there's a doctor says, don't do this. I just want to encourage you to, to consider it, to, to, to take a moment to, to consider what our relationship with is with food in our body. Because Scripture makes it clear. Fasting is the spiritual discipline of refraining from food for a period of time to focus or to refocus our hearts on God. And what I learned as we read the Scripture is that Jesus doesn't say, if you fast, He says, when you fast. And God does great things when we expect more from Him. God does great things when we expect more and follow through with Him. So why should we fast? Do we do it to, to show that we're in control of our bodies? Some people do. Some people fast because they're getting a medical procedure the next day. That is no fun. Been there, done that. Um, um, some people fast while they're in Guatemala or Mexico because they're just terrified. Um, I've done that as well. I fasted from all things that might have ever touched water um, while we were there in Guatemala. Um, and, but fasting is a spiritual discipline designed to humble your heart and your soul. It focuses your heart and your mind. When should you fast? Well, whenever you find yourself persistently and consistently praying for something, bringing it before God, petitioning on a regular basis, maybe that's, that's something you might want to consider offering before God in a fast. 
uh, there, there are big reasons to, to consider fasting. If you get ready to choose a college, that might be a reason to fast. If you're getting ready to make a job uh, change, that might be a reason to consider fasting. If, if um, you're, you're getting ready to pick a spouse, that might be a reason to fast. Big reasons. And so commit yourself, to, commit yourself and your body to God in big, big ways. Trust that he'll show up. Now, there's a bunch of different kinds of fasts that Scripture talks about. There's the absolute fast, which is absolutely no food, no water. Um, I mean, absolutely no food, no drink. And if you remember the story of Esther, do you guys remember the story of Esther? Esther petitioned, had to go before the king and risk her life. But before she did that, in order to ask to save the lives of her people, she spent three days, no food, no water. And she asked all of her people to do the same thing because it was so important because she was trying to save the lives of all of her people. Uh, there's a normal fast where there's no food, but you can still drink water and juice. This is the kind of fast that Jesus did when he was uh, in the wilderness for 40 days. Um, and the Bible makes it really clear that when Jesus was in the wilderness, at the end of that time, he was really hungry. What was the first thing that the devil tempted Jesus with? Food. Food. Always remember that the goal of a fast isn't to show how strong you are, isn't to show what kind of willpower you have, but it's to deepen your relationship with God. Now, there's also a partial fast, which is what I did in Guatemala. I didn't choose to eat fruits, and I didn't choose to eat vegetables, anything that was touched by water. You, you select something and you say, I'm going to take that out of my, out of my diet, and I'm going to use those, those moments that I think about them as cues to bring me back into focus, why I'm here, what I'm doing. You can also do uh, other kinds of fasts. You can do, a, like you saw on the screen, one of the students had mentioned that they are on a screen fast while they were in Mexico, um, but, uh, where they're taking all tech away from themselves. So that this thing, the internet, is something we also consume a lot of. Many of us are consuming it at record amounts. We're living with screens all the time. Maybe taking a tech fast and saying, I'm not going to be on screen for 24 hours. I'm not going to check the internet. I'm not going to play uh, anything would be, a, would, would be a way of starting that discipline of fasting. Now, I, I read a study that said high school students would rather lose their car privileges than lose their internet access. Think about that. Their connection to the net is so deep that they would rather not have the ability to leave and go anywhere because they'd still be connected to everyone. And it's just the culture that we're growing up in. It's not good or bad, it, but it, it is one of the things we have to consider. Maybe letting go of that so you can take time to focus and have a deeper relationship with Christ. Can you bring up the next slide, please? When I grew up, I was an uh, avid astronomy buff. I had my own little telescope, um, I'd set it up in uh, Southern California out in our driveway, and I'd point my telescope to the stars. People called me Professor Mike. They thought I, uh, I thought that was really cool because I thought I knew a lot of stuff, but I really knew nothing at all. I was a, I was a bluffer, and uh, I pointed it at Saturn, and I focused it, and, and every time someone else would look at, the, look at Saturn, they would, they would adjust the focus because I didn't know it, but my eyes were bad at the time. And so it's like, why is your focus different than my focus? Because their eyes were fixed, mine weren't. And so I would stare at that, and I'd go, that's just the coolest thing ever. And when I heard about in 1990 that they were going to launch the Hubble Space Telescope, Space Telescope, I just love saying that because it's so cool. They're going to put a telescope in space. <laughs> this is awesome. It's just so awesome because they'd be able to see so many things. It was going to change astronomy like it's never been changed before. But they had a problem. Well, bring up the picture of the, the telescope, please. That's the Hubble telescope floating, uh, orbiting Earth. And it's really cool. It's awesome. It's large. It's, a, it's got a, it's an amazing piece of technology. But soon after they launched it and had it going and they got it operational, they realized when the pictures started coming in, they had a problem. Because the pictures that it was sending in were blurry and fuzzy. They were out of focus. And suddenly, NASA had a billion-dollar oops on their hands. 
Because this, this device that was designed to, to focus on the stars, that was designed to help un bring an untold amount of understanding to our scientific community, was blurry. For three years, they didn't know what to do. They launched a repair mission, replaced some of the cameras, fixed some of the, some of the reflective material, and they pointed the Hubble after they fixed it at this little patch of darkness in space. If we look at the naked eye, there is nothing there. If you look with your regular telescopes, there is nothing there. And so they pointed the Hubble at this for week after week after week. It's, it's called the long stare. It just, just stared into the, peered into the darkness for weeks. And then the Hubble sent back the image that it captured. Take a look at this. Next slide, please. That's in pitch darkness. Now, if you take a closer look, you'll notice something even cooler. Next slide, please. Those are galaxies. Not just stars. Those are full galaxies that the Hubble saw through a long stare, a, a period of focus, a period of intentionally doing something that, well, it couldn't do until its focus was fixed. Next slide. Fasting is a spiritual discipline that provides us with long-term focus and refocus. It helps us to discern our actions and to help us as we plead our case before God. If there are things that you want to see happen, things in the world that you want to see change, I encourage you to consider putting your life on the line, putting your, at least your appetite on the line and see what happens. So what should we be fasting for? All the big things in your life, for your friends, for your families, for your enemies, for our government, for our world, for those kids that go to camp that encounter Jesus, for our friends in Palestine, for our friends in Eden, for our friends all over the globe. We need to be people that are taking Jesus seriously and at his word. Now, there's something that's coming up in the life of our church that I, wanna con I want you to consider fasting for. Can you bring up the next slide? In September and October, Shepherd of the Hills, along with about 200 churches, is going to be participating in a program called Explore God. It's a, ser it's a series of sermons that will be preached, but it's also an invitation to start dialogue with your friends and your families all over uh, your community, whether it's um, at work or at the, the lunch bar. You are invited to start spiritual conversations. Now, Explore God is this program that's you, because it's not what's going to happen in church, it's going to happen with you, because here are the questions that we're going to be talking about. Can you bring up the, the slide with the questions? Does life have a purpose? Is there a God? Why does God allow pain and suffering? Is Jesus really God? Is the Bible reliable? Can I know God personally? Is Christianity too narrow? Big questions that people outside of church really want to have conversations, honest conversations about. And I think these conversations are so important that maybe you might want to fast for it. Whether it's a technological fast, a partial fast, a normal fast, or even an absolute fast. Taking our discipleship seriously. Next slide, please. Our goal is that over 400,000 spiritual conversations might occur. 400,000 conversations here in Austin, people talking about those questions, just having the conversation, not with an intent to, to drag them to church, not with an intent to convert them, but to begin the process of talking about the things that God wants us to be talking about. And at least 50,000 people through that process hearing the message of Jesus Christ. Next slide, please. So would you consider possibly taking this thing that Jesus says we're supposed to do, to fast, and point your heart, refocus your heart on the long stare, on what God is going to be doing here in Austin, and offering your appetite to God, just for one day. I'm inviting you this week to join me on Tuesday as I fast. Right after lunch, stop eating. It's 24 hours. When you get back to lunch the next day, you can have lunch. And in that 24-hour period, take time to pray. Take time to consider. Take time to offer yourself to God. 
and allow God to be moving in the lives of the people that have those questions and are going to respond to those questions. Would you consider fasting with me starting on Tuesday? Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you that you, you bring us to a place that is absolutely amazing, that you invite us to a time where, where we are drawn to, to take a long and deep stare at you, to, to know you better, to experience you more fully. And God, as, as, we, as we go into this time of prayer, there's, we're going watch to watch a video, and um, God, I, I just pray that we would get it that you fill us, that you move us, that you, that you make us complete when we follow you fully. Let us focus our hearts on you by praying the prayer you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father.